Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Megan Sylvester, and I'm a music sociologist. And today we are joined by Frankie McIntosh for this particular podcast, which is entitled Calypso, the New York Experience. And what we're going to be doing in this particular series is that we are going to be having a conversation with Frankie McIntosh as he tells us about his sojourn in the Calypso fraternity. We want to get a sense from him of his involvement, who he has worked with, what has been the, some of the experiences and where he sees the Calypso at home going beyond today. So, Mr. McIntosh, welcome to this interview. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thanks for the invitation. You're very Thanks welcome. for considering me worthy of this interview. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. So, at the very start, give us a sense of who you are and how you became involved in the Calypso Art Club. Well, <clears throat> my name is Frank Franklin McIntosh. Most people refer to me as Frankie. Okay. Um, I was born in St. Vincent, uh, with St. Denise. Um, I was born in the sense into a musical family. My father and all his siblings were musicians. Um, my father started a band even before I was born, which was um, he called the Melotones, okay. and they played dance music. Um, they accompanied local Calypsonians, not only local Calypsonians, but those coming from Trinidad, like Spoiler and so on. As a matter of fact, there's a story which I always tell, which my parents told me, of course, that when I was a baby, uh, maybe just a few days old, Spoiler and a few other Calypsonians from Trinidad came over to St. Vincent to do a show. And normally they would rehearse at... <clears throat> my grandfather's place where we all lived. My father lived and me as a baby. So Spoiler came in to where I was in the crib and he picked me up and he improvised the Kaiser right there. That this little baby gonna be a musician like his father. <laughs> and all this I was so prophetic, you know? I so agree. anyway, as uh, you know, as I got older, um, I started playing saxophone. Uh, that's before I started playing piano in bands. I started playing uh, saxophone. My father taught me the mechanics of the saxophone, and later I switched to to piano. I started taking piano lessons, formal piano lessons, classical, and um, then I became the pianist in melotones. Ah, oh. yep. And uh, that was about the age, I was about age of nine or somewhere there about. Uh, well, sub subsequent to that, um, when I entered <clears throat> boys' grammar school, I was about 14. Well, I entered when I was about nine, but at the age of 14, I formed my own band with some school friends and relatives, you know, my and friends around town. Anybody who's a friend could have joined Frankie Band. <laughs> kind of thing. So, um, and we kind of continued the tradition. We played for, you know, dances. We played for back in Calypsonians and so on. Um, subsequent to that, I, when I graduated from <clears throat> high school, uh, well, grammar school, we call it grammar school, as you know, I um, taught for a little over a year at a secondary school. I was teaching English literature and something else. Wow. And then from there, <laughs> <laughs> I moved to Antigua. And I always tell this joke, uh, this true story, but with advanced levels uh, teaching in a secondary school, I was in the day, this is about 1965, 66. I was making $165 a year, a, a month, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, a month. <laughs> so it was considered good money in, in those days. Okay. But then I got a call from Antigua, the leader of a band who, who was uh, of intention, but he moved to Antigua and became leader of this band called Laviscon. Mm -hmm. So Cooper, his, was his name, Cooper Prescott. So he called and he said, look, we really stopped for this August Monday um, weekend. Uh, our pianist left and we need a replacement. Could you come help us out? So I said, okay. So I went to Antigua. <laughs> so I, got a, <laughs> I got a permission from the principal right. to do that. And I went. Um, 
And I played for like a, one weekend. And on the Monday, Cooper paid me $600. Hmm. And then he asked, you want to stay with us? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the end of that. <laughs> that's a no-brainer, right? So I, um, of course, I wrote a, an apologetic letter to the principal. <laughs> <I> said, <"Look." laughs> and I worked at Antigua. I mean, and Antigua at that time, and as far as work for musicians, I think they were ahead of all the other islands, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, I used Antigua as a stepping stone to come to New York. Oh, okay. Because yes. I wanted to, um, you know, to study music, I mean, at the college level. Right. So I enrolled at Brooklyn College. Um, okay. And while at Brooklyn College, I um, was <clears throat> doing like little gigs around, like mostly like jazz gigs, R&B gigs, because even back in St. Vincent, I'd been playing, I'd been exposed to jazz because a lot, a lot of my father's repertoire with melatones was jazz, you know, Foxtrot, Duke Ellington, Kong B.C., that kind of thing. Right. And then, right. um, then, it was about in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, Beckett approached me because he had a problem with some music and um, for boat ride. And so I helped him out with it. And after that, he came back to me to do a CD. <laughs> we did a CD and that turned out to be a big one. Uh, that was the one with um, Coming High. Uh, coming High, High, High. Right, right. With, yes, right. yes. Right. So, and from there, you know, it just kind of blossomed. You know, I, I did crazy, the, thing, the one with the um, Parang Soka and all of that. Right. And then um, when I was working with ex- explainers, you know. Yes. And um, Juke, Calypso Rose, Shock Dust, whomever. Mm-hmm. Um, Winston Soso, you know, continued to back it. Mm-hmm. And so here I am now, I mean, pretty much, in, <laughs> I would say, uh, in retirement mode, as far as teaching, uh, I got into t- t- teaching, you know, when a range and work started slowing down. Okay. I, I, okay. I looked into my um, drawers and pulled out my, my, my degrees from New York University and, um, what you call it, and Brooklyn College yes. and, and, t- and started teaching. And, you know, the arranging kind of work kind of tapered off. I mean, I still do mm, a bit of it on the computer and send it to various studios, mm-hmm. but not so much the live thing, like going into the studio and okay. recording anymore. Yeah, and uh, of course I work with, with Keith, right. the designer, right. of course, right. can't, can't right. leave that out. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so that's a kind of synopsis of um, well, okay. right now I'm into the grandparent mode, babysitting. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what I want to do, though, at this time, so thanks for giving us that trajectory of your career. I mean, you really, you, you, you sped through it, but you gave us, you know, the highlights. What I'm interested in is the association with the view from the fraternity that you are this superstar arranger. And I want to get this link to your early beginnings playing in your father's band. And do you think that it is just a natural talent? Or do you think that being within the musical family as it were coming up, that is what sort of led you to be the skilled craftsman in music arranging and production? Okay. <clears throat> well, as far as the superstar the status, you ever saw this program called um, the, Porn <laughs> Fa- the Porn Famous? No, uh, no. <laughs> but I, I that star in that, you know. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, um, regarding the second question, is it nature or nurture? Mm. I says I'm a boat. Um, you know, considering my, my father was a musician, all the siblings were uh, uh, musicians. Um, my grandfather, you know, he was both politician, musician, several chemists, druggists. Um, okay. So, I mean, being in that environment, you know, certainly guided me toward um, being a musician. But then again, I was pretty good at academics, you know, mm-hmm. on a scholarship from um, <clears throat> at an early age from elementary school into secondary school. Okay. Because okay. if I didn't do a scholarship, my parents could not afford me to, to, to go to secondary school. So um, 
my mother wanted me to be a medical doctor and this, but I think it was in my choice, you know, to a large extent, because I had a choice of, um, you know, studying anything that I wanted, mm -hmm. but um, I chose to study music. Um, that's as close to my heart. Right. You know, so right. it's, it's some, yeah, the environment, yes, mm -hmm. and then I, I would think genetics is some, some you can't, you know, just don't my father there. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and I ask that because you know, as I listen to so many of these interviews um, of professionals within the industry, persons don't know that they had the backing of their family, and you know it is very interesting when you hear those who really did. You realize that they are the ones who had that support system, had that interest, had that sort of um, appreciation for what they were doing, and it sort of facilitated their growth in the industry. And it's good for you to say that music was, you know, close to your heart and that is what you really had a, a partial for. In terms of working with artists, you spoke, you started off speaking about Beckett and then you sort of gave a list of some of the persons that you worked with. What went into your decision to work with an artist or not work with an artist? Huh. Well, <clears throat> the mere fact that they agreed to pay my fee. <laughs> <laughs> I said that might have been primary, <laughs> but, but mm -hmm. um, I don't think I ever had to make a decision whether or not to work with an artist. And it wasn't just about money; it's only only kidding. Mm -hmm. But I found that each artist brought something different to to the table, okay. and I had a, a, a deep interest in the way. Say, for instance, an, an artist from, from Trinidad would how he would construct his melody mm. as compared to how someone from Antigua would do that, how mm. someone from St. Vincent or Grenada would do that, even within this, the same limits, like um, geographical limits, like Trinidad, mm. um, it there would be a, a, a difference, a difference in enunciation, a difference in phrasing, mm -hmm. you know. So, it's a curiosity, I would say, and um, I never consciously had to make a make a decision uh, that I would not want to work with X or Y. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, what are your fondest memories? Oh, because you said <laughs> you're in sort of semi time on grandparent mode, and you've taken up teaching. But as you think about your career, what are some of your fondest memories of working with the different artists across the Caribbean and in New York? Hmm, fondest memory. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> it's hard for me to pick out, um, pick any out. Um, again, I mean, it's a different experience at, at each, okay. each of them. I mean, there are amusing ones, ones that bring back um, humorous memories, like Explainer, for instance, <laughs> with the, um, with, which we discussed in a, in a previous chat. Yes. Um, with the oil in the door, the door knob, right, and, right, and, and, right. and all that. Mm -hmm. um, working with Sparrow mm. wasn't, you know, I, I really look forward to doing that when I did his um, the album with Don't Back Back, because right. Sparrow is one of my heroes from very young. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. I used to try to storm <laughs> the parties, the, the dances, the <laughs> I mean, sure, sorry to see, see Sparrow. Right, and right. Here I am now working with Sparrow. So, yeah, so that was, um, that's a big moment for me, actually being in the studio with Sparrow. He actually you came to my house a couple of times and to work out the songs in, in the basement. Mm -hmm. So I, I cherish that moment. Um, mm -hmm. Working with Beckett, uh, well, after after the fact, after working on him or from after working on him for, for several years, Beckett became like a a member of the family. Oh, you know? okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, even today, I mean, I'll go, go back to St. Vincent. Beckett, by the way, moved back there. Okay. Beckett as soon as he knows I'm there, he come pick me up, have some lady in, in the you cook this big thing of pillow when we go down when we eat. My wife, all of us, you know, we mm -hmm. go on the on the beach and stuff. Yeah, yeah so I mean, fond in in the, in in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, chalk dust. Yeah, I mean, I could tell a story <laughs> for each person that uh, that I work with. You know, right, right, right. So, 
Yes. Okay, so tell me a little bit about your process, if you will, um, in terms of, because, you know, a lot of, let me just give you a little example of what I mean. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of secondary school lectures, and I um, liaise with the music teachers in the schools, the visual and performing arts teachers, and so I'm speaking specifically to music students. And sometimes they, some of the boys and some of the girls sometimes want to know about careers in the music industry. So not everybody is thinking about being a singer, a back, a, um, you know, a backup singer. Some people really want to do production. They want to do arranging. You know, these children are very curious and they're very, the, 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 the industry and the music that they know that is more tangible or, or, you know, something that they can actually touch and feel is the indigenous music that they are exposed to. Um, and so they really want to know what is the process? How can I become a music engineer? How can I become a music arranger? And sometimes the process is something that they are not taught at that age. I mean, they then go to school for it, but it's interesting um, that they have that curiosity. Could you tell us a little bit about that process? Hmm. Well, well, for me, I think I recognize or realize, um, you know, earlier, earlier clock, as, as they say, home, that, um, Whichever field of music I wanted to engage in, I would have to be trained in it to study, to know about as much about it as possible. So I would say the, the first aspect would be education. If you want to study some production, I mean, you could fiddle around with, with, with programs, software programs and speakers and mixers and so on at home. Mm -hmm. But the science of it mm -hmm. that has been, you know, documented like over the years and taught uh, at high institutions of learning, I would recommend doing that. Become not only acquiring the knowledge, but becoming qualified in okay. it, getting mm -hmm. some sort of paper or something, you know. So in case you had to apply for a job, you recognize, yeah, I studied here. This is my 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 diploma. Mm -hmm. Um. And then the other aspect would be uh, ex experience, you know, um, try to, to do as much of it as, as you can. And the more you do, I mean, the, the better you get <laughs> at what you're doing, I mean, through experience. Mm -hmm. um, I remember an uh, old economics teacher used to say, you know, there's natural ability, there's training, and then there's experience. Right. And whatever you're going to do, be sure you, you know, fill, you fulfill those three boxes. Right. And so I, I, I thought about that. Um, I was, I meant, well, my goal, sorry, was to be a, a pianist, you know. Mm. But I realized that um, with children to feed, <laughs> four kids to, to <laughs> feed, <laughs> that that wasn't going to make it. You know, and I look at really right. good pianists, me okay. who better than me, mm -hmm. who are looking for gigs and, and mm -hmm. all that. So he said, you know what? I think I just, you know, put piano in, in a band mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. pick up uh, arranging. And arranging uh -huh. was, su was successful. Well, okay. I had done arranging as part of my training at, at, at the college level, in an orchestration. At ah, okay, and, okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so... But I, I don't know whether I'm going to <laughs> be too prolix with, with, with this answer, but I don't know if that would suffice. No, no, no certainly it is. Certainly it is, because I think mm -hmm. that that is what they would like to know. How do they begin? What do they start thinking? They know they like it. They're not too sure where to go. And it becomes important for them to have some sort of blueprint to work with. Um, in terms of your sojourn in New York City, let's talk a little bit about that and what that experience was in terms of working with the artists who were up here. Is it, was it any different to working with them in the Caribbean or working with artists who didn't come up to New York? Tell us a little bit about that, those experiences. Hmm. Well, I really didn't do much arranging in the Caribbean. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we did play for singers. Um, in Antigua, I think I did a, a range, which was for a band, not for a, a singer. The, the thing is that in New York, even though the recordings were done in New York, that most of the artists, you know, mm -hmm. would come up from Trinidad or come up from Antigua 
um, okay. like like a little before carnival, they will right. come up, record, and then and then go back. Okay. So it was really working with Caribbean <laughs> musicians in New York. So we ah. had to do a comparison, working with them in the Caribbean as opposed to working with them in New York. Mm -hmm. And they came to New York because there were better at the time there were better studios okay. here, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I can I can really can make a comparison in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but what I could say is that when artists came from Trinidad and Vincent, Grenada, or whatever, and I had to work with them in the studio. They would bring sunshine in because I felt kind of cut off from the Caribbean in a sense. Yeah, so they would okay. come with stories of the latest happenings. Boy, you know what happened here um, mm -hmm. up Cyan Hill or whatever. And we could converse that way. And you know, at least temporarily, I would be able to kind of reunite with that aspect of mm -hmm. my, my being. <laughs> right. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so thanks for sharing that because I guess it, it gives us a sense of that camaraderie that exists within and amongst, um, you know, uh, between and amongst the, the, the Calypsonians or the people within the fraternity. Um, what, tell us, because this is a series entitled Calypso, the New York Experience, can you tell us, um, apart from the fact that there, were, there was better equipment, or better, there was better studio um, facilities available, what did New York City as a, as a space add to the value of the production element? So is there anything that you can speak to? Because it could have been in another city, could have been in Los Angeles, Toronto, you know. Um, and so is there anything specific that New York brought to the activity? Okay. So I uh, think we should narrow New York a little uh, to Brooklyn. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> <Because> Brooklyn, <laughs> yeah, Brooklyn, like you have, you have all the islands represented in Brooklyn. You even have areas like, the, you know, Jamaicans and Antiquans in the Bronx, you know, Trinidadians, Attentions, Grenadians in Brooklyn. Uh, well, sorry. Well, there, there are Jamaicans and Antiquans in, in Brooklyn too. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I mean, Brooklyn is it, it, like the Caribbean, you know, in, 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 a, in a sense, um, the whole Caribbean, the whole Anglophone Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And what I think the artists found in Brooklyn were producers who okay. were willing to pay for the studio. Mm -hmm. um, people like Charlie and Stricker, they were based mm -hmm. here in mm -hmm. New York. I mean, mm -hmm. they had record stores. And so on. So you had someone like Stricker who would produce an artist, you know, pay for all the expenses. But then he also had an outlet where mm -hmm. he could um, sell the record. So there's an advantage in that sense. Stricker mm -hmm. also had a record store too in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, then Charlie came into it. So, had, so not only the studios, as you say, but the, the producers. Mm -hmm. And... Um, well, they would also come back not to record, but for, for work like during Labor Day yes. and, and so on. And some would take advantage of being here for Labor Day mm -hmm. to record. Um, mm -hmm. Rather than go back to Trinidad, I'd have to pay to come back. They would just stay one time, record, right. and then when they go back, you know, they would go back with a, with a product. Right. The product could be, would be sent, sent back to mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um... In speaking to persons within the fraternity, they've spoken about Queens uh, having some sort of, you know, uh, some studios. I don't know if there was an issue or not, not necessarily an issue, but a comparison between Brooklyn, Brooklyn Studios and Queens Studios in terms of were there any artists that you worked with that were specifically Queens based? Or is it that all of that you've been speaking about, they came up from the Caribbean and they just worked in Brooklyn? Is that what happened? I just want to get a sense of that New York space and if there was any uh, distinction that you could mention. Uh, uh, Sometimes I get clear. A distinction between Brooklyn and what? Queens. Queens. Oh, Queens. If there was any studios, yeah. Yeah. We were producing, you know, and did you work with any yeah. artists who were working out of Queens studios or anything like that? Okay. Well, we it, it depends on the, on the time period we're talking about because mm -hmm. when I was arranging, when I started arranging, like, you know, early 70s or so. I really didn't know of any studios in Queens. I, I think later on, 
Okay. There was um, a, a guy, um, an Indian gentleman, who opened the the studio in Queens, and Franklin Grant, I remember, was the engineer there. Okay. Um, but studios in Queens came later. Okay. I didn't. I have. I hadn't done much recording in in Queens, but mm -hmm. most my clients they mm -hmm. opted for Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So, and I live in Brooklyn, so <laughs> it's easier <laughs> okay. for me. <laughs> yes, no problem. What do you think? So doing a sort of retrospective, Calypso then, Calypso now, what are your thoughts on the industry? Hmm. The industry, well, and the, and the art, well, there's, there's two different, two, two factors related. Absolutely, but... <laughs> yes. So you, speak, so you can speak about both, the status of Calypso. Then <laughs> well, I mean... Okay, just as a general, you know, idea, uh, observation. Calypso, when I was young, you know, when I was still living back home, what I, I remember everybody singing the same song. Mm -hmm. Old, middle-aged, young, everybody would sing Sparrow, we young and strong, we feel us, fear the soul in tongue. This youngest child would be singing that. And the oldest person would be singing that. I mean, today... They seem to be following the American, you know, mm. procedure of um, marketing by demographic demographics. So now you have music for, for the very for the young, and you have music for the middle ages. Who will say, boy, you know, this soca song from you know nineteen eighties was better than anything they're doing now. And you have you know diehards who say nothing better than Sparrow and Kitchener and Bomber Boy in, back in them days. Mm -hmm. And so. You don't have everybody singing the same song anymore. Okay. And I think that's, you know, that's a, a tragic as far as looking at it f from a social or sociological um, aspect. I'm not a sociologist, but mm -hmm. I think um, we lost some kind of unity there mm -hmm. between the generation, generational so we're speaking. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the art goes, hmm. Um, in in well calypso itself so before we even get into that i think of calypso in three main phases you mm -hmm. had you have your vintage calypso mm -hmm. with like attila and so on which more after moving into like sparrow kitchen and so on so even within the um category of calypso you have like at least two main phases attila that the sparrow my for me the golden age of Calypso was, I guess it has to do with experience. Mm -hmm. What I experienced, you'd have to have a bias, <laughs> of course. It would be mm -hmm. Sparrow, that, that era, Sparrow Melody, Kitchener, and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, after that, now you get into the Soka period where Shorty decides, well, look, Calypso ain't really selling, which I really didn't find was true because when Shorty started the, the, the Soka thing, um, Calypso records were still playing. Calypso shows were happening all over the place in Canada, Montreal, here, and so on. And so mm -hmm. that's the sec uh, second phase. The third phase, I would say, would be what people like Marshall and stuff are doing now. Mm -hmm. Now, I would probably have to write a whole dissertation to, for us to go through all of that. But generally, if we take just Calypso, the Calypso yes. as far as zero, mm -hmm. and say the Soka era from Shorty into um you know Blue Boy and, yeah. and so on. Mm -hmm. Um some of the features of Calypso I would say um it, well there was always a some sort of message, right? A, a philosophical yeah. or you mm -hmm. know some something to do with morality, you know. Um you know like far as singing education for instance the importance of education. So okay. there was something there. There was music for dancing too, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, there was you, you could de you definitely tell through the lyrics. Mm -hmm. uh, this this is what this is geared toward, and in right. some cases you could dance to the philosophical or, or right. social political, political tunes. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, well, let me jump to to soca. Yes, sure. so, yeah, soca. I mean, although there were those, you know, those kinds of messages too, but I find most of it was, was geared for dancing 
and as far as the mu musical elements went, the soca was not as sophisticated uh, harmonically as was uh, calypso. Okay. Um, the there was more of an emphasis on on a on a punchline, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a matter of matter of developing a story. And then right, right into the punchline. You got to the punchline early, and then you repeat that a, 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 a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, in well, this to me there really isn't much of a dis distinction between soca and of course. Yeah, okay. because so, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. As as Paro said, I mean, and I think I mentioned this before. To, to you, Sparrow defines Soka as a Calypso, which failed to grow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, what he's referring to goes back to what I was speaking about as far as the harmony went. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there were the, all these colorful chords and so on, like from Bertram Minnis playing the piano and behind Sparrow. And then, mm -hmm. and then you come to Soka songs, which was mostly like, you know, Tri triadic, you know, the C chord to an F chord, and you go to a G chord, and you go back to the C chord. But it's, it's, a, it's a simple. Right. Um, so I think that's what you, you was referring to. Mm -hmm. um, so there was an, an attrition of, of harmony there in, in Soka as, as, appear, as, as, a, as compared with uh, Calypso. Mm -hmm. um, the As in Calypso too, um, well, as, as several thoughts go, going going through my mind actually. Uh, as far as the basic beat went, the Calypso used the uh, what I call the Tricello rhythm, like um, if I could outline it, the, the bass drum would, would play straight. One, two, three, four, and the snare drum would go tap, 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 right. tap. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you put all that together, come and the composite would be like tap, 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 tap. That's that's a tree. Now, yeah. in in like um, Puerto Rico and, and Cuba and stuff, they would have the tree to clap, which would go one, two, three, pop, pop. Mm -hmm. Or the change it around and have the two and, and the three. But mm -hmm. in the calypso, we um the early calypso would kind of emphasize the tree. Mm -hmm. So stay on that. Okay. Um as Soka you know, developed and I'd find more that even in Marshall's music, mm -hmm. they would start to incorporate the, the, the two and the tree. So you'd okay. have doom, 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 doom. So yeah, um, I don't want to, <laughs> if anyone listen to this, I don't want to bore them too much with, um, you know, mm -hmm. for, for the formal aspects uh, mm -hmm. of, of music. But um, one of the advantages of, of soca, it seems, is mm -hmm. so it was easy to sell, mm -hmm. um, you know, and eventually, um, so Calypso, Someone posed a, a question, yes, yes, yesterday uh, on an interview. Why is it the Calypso then hasn't sold as much as Rick? And I, I hope I'm not going off at a, a tangent here, but it's mm -hmm. related. Mm -hmm. And it, it it occurred to me that um, when Americans sing Calypso, like uh, Harry Belafonte and, and so on, right. that they are successful. Mm -hmm. uh, when the melody, sings his own calypso right. he's not nearly as successful as as, as belafonte right so it seems as though when soko came around they managed to find distributors which were able to get that music into areas where calypso you know hadn't penetrated right right so, yeah, so I don't know if we really need to go on. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's interesting because that is an important question that a lot of people are concerned about. They talk about uh, like the break, 
that Bob Marley would have gotten because he had um a godfather as it were, you yes. know, and and yes. and but but what we are, what some of us may be aware of is that that same individual who went to Bob Marley would have come to the Rashoti or uh, you know before, and it becomes interesting to think about the decisions that were made um about the exploiting of the genre and uh you know wanting you know to keep it indigenous to keep it within as opposed to you know working with someone who was white someone who was external to the caribbean and allowing them to lead and guide um yes. musical decision making yes you and so if i may add something to that um jamaica is now close to like what three million people there. I mean, 2 million mm -hmm. 800,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And Trinidad is roughly like about half mm -hmm. the population of, of Jamaica. Now, mm -hmm. I observe that Jamaicans tend to support reggae exclusively. <laughs> Jamaicans right. will support reggae and reggae and reggae. Mm -hmm. um, in the other islands um, would be more open and support uh, Calypso Soka, but it will also be embracing of, of reggae. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, um, I was reading an article the other day where they claim that a lot of stations, not only in Trinidad, but in the other islands outside of Jamaica, after Carnival finished, you'd hear more reggae than you hear um, the Calypso Soka. I don't know if that's true, mm -hmm. but that explains in a, in a sense, I mean, the, um, the success of reggae. Mm -hmm. uh, owing to the support it gets locally and internationally, you know, as opposed to Calypso. I know we started talking about Calypso and Stoke, and now we're talking about just Calypso yes. and Reggae, but it's yes. related. Yes. <laughs> the ways in which Trinidadians see and perceive <laughs> Calypso, take it away. Yeah, well, not only Trinidadians, but um, Vincentians, Grenadians, Antiguans, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, um, you know, years ago, I attended, I played for a, a show. It was um, put on by some travel agents, some travel agents here in New York. And they were um, trying to decide how to, you know, build up the, the number of tourists, you know, mm -hmm. that would use their services, you know, to get to Jamaica. They were mostly, okay, let's say there, there were 100 agents there. The majority were white. Okay. And they would come and make speeches about, you know, why you should go to Jamaica and so on. Mm -hmm. So one of the few black agents, uh, travel agents, came up and, and he said, well, look, you should go to Jamaica because we have we have 15 um, golf courses, you know, where you mm -hmm. could play golf. Yeah. And a white lady was standing behind him. She was a white American. She tapped him and said, no, it's 21. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so you see that she, he corrected himself based on the, yeah. yeah. So um, I found that when, when they sell this package, I mean, for, for tourism, they sell reggae. Come to Jamaica, the, the land of reggae, the land of Bob Marley, the land of mm -hmm. this. And so I, I thought to myself, that's that's one way, you know, in which reggae really became, you know, international, nationalized. And then I was looking at a video the other day by a Jamaican who commented that um, reggae might be making money, but he posed the question, making money for whom? Mm. And he showed that the reggae artists themselves are really not making as much as we would think, that okay. those people really benefit from, benefit from, from reggae would be the um, big companies in Europe, you know, in England, in America, and okay. so on, okay. really making a, a, a killing um, off of reggae. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so just to start, you know, that would be important to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it's not just, it, it really doesn't have to do with the art of, of it itself or the art, artistic merit. It has to do with the way it is sold, <laughs> okay. it's promoted and, and 
in which uh, Calypso, and several other, other things too. I mean, you know, but uh, which I prefer not to not to discuss. In and this that's forum. fine. And that's fine. <laughs> I completely understand that. <laughs> so as we look forward towards you know twenty twenty four, we're thinking about the status of Calypso. People like to get into this whole discussion about whether Calypso is dying or dead because of. Uh, the attrition that has taken place in terms of um, uh, uh, event uh, participants, people who don't go to, you know, their empty seats at Calypso shows. Um, and I'm talking about in Trinidad in particular. Um, uh, but what I do know about the New York experience is that more and more, there are less and less <laughs> Calypso activities taking place. And the younger generation is really just into soca music. What is your view on the status of Calypso today? Hmm. Well, I mean, Calypso, what do you call it? Calypso Soko or whatever. I mean, it is an expression of artists who are influenced, the artists influenced by what they experience through the times, economics, you know, whatever, world affairs and whatever, mm -hmm. you know, technology. Yeah. And um, the types of programs, um, software programs, types of synthesizers, the songs, the new songs uh, available now weren't available back in, in the early days of Sparrow, uh, uh, you know, Charters and so on. Um, and I think the younger generation, they're making use of that. Mm. And uh, I mean, admirably so. You know, they should, because, I mean, the piano is really a tool. The piano is invented what, back in the 1600 and something. And it's a, a tool, a means of making music. I mean, the songs you could listen from a, a, a piano, no matter how expensive it is, a big grand piano, whatever. But it's, it's really limited. It's synthesizer, mm -hmm. um, you know, offers a wide variety, depending on how you use it. I mean, true. Oh. Yeah, so I think Marshall's generation, I think they um making good use of the technology. Um, I think the the music now is more geared toward performance than someone putting on a record, a wax record, and listening to it at home mm -hmm. and say, "Oh, that's nice. I like that solo. I like that or whatever." But it's, it's more performance uh, or oriented. Okay. Um, and there's the idea of the the, the media buildup of a star, okay. you know. Okay. So, yeah, pe people <clears throat> they hear a name, mm -hmm. and before they hear the song, they say, "Okay, we're going to buy that, or we have to go right. to the show," right. you know, because yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. long ago, to write the song, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, you would hear a sparrow song on, on, the, on the radio, say, mm, "Yeah." You mm -hmm. hear the song first and you, you go out by the record. Uh, to, today also, I mean, and it has to go with technology too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I find a lot of people see music before they, they hear it. It's audiovisual. They have these they have the right. videos now. Each right. hit has to be accompanied by a video. Right. And they, they, they are, are more influenced by what they see than what they hear. Yes. I also find that... um. The melodies now in the in the modern music, in, in the popular music, um, they're not as use the word of, of contour. They don't have the kind of contour, the flow, the rise, you know, the ebb and flow mm -hmm. of like uh, the, the a calypso, the typical calypso. Mm -hmm. um, they're more kind of static. You hear da 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 da. They might jump up and then come back and. The, uh, the melodies don't kind of move. They, mm -hmm. they don't imitate life in a sense. Mm -hmm. that, um, and that seems to be affecting Panorama. Okay. Because I listen to Panorama arrangements. I mean, and they're doing fant fantastic work with what they have. Right. But I think they're limited in in the in the melodies that they have now. As, mm -hmm. as opposed to what people like um, Jit Samaru, Ray Harmon, mm -hmm. and, and stuff would have done with, as a matter of fact, some of them, uh, even going back to the old songs, 
main arrangement right. the older songs like yes. I don't I don't mind and, right. and all of that. Yeah. So the advantage the, the pros and cons. Okay. You know? Um mm -hmm. in the new music there are no reflective or pensive moods as they were in Calypso. You had to arrange the moods in right. Calypso on right, and, and, and the topic. Um mm -hmm. A lot of the new music is, I find too, is influenced by Jamaican reggae. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, what else? Uh, a lot of it is looped. So okay. you, you would find a few seconds of music. Mm -hmm. And that's extended, extended. Right. As far as the music goes. And then they would superimpose like little catch, catch lines, you know, mm -hmm. um, on top of that. And it's always a, a, a matter of the singer, you know, being like the the the, the leader exhorting the audience what to do. You mm -hmm. have to jump, you have to raise your hand, you have to raise a, with a rag, you have to do this. It's really not telling a story. So they, they become the followers, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And we just opened it, the pipe pipe doesn't come come around. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. All right. So um, tell me, is there anything that you wanted to mention that you don't think you got an opportunity to mention? Um, not, not really. Okay. Not really. I think um, you, 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 you covered quite a bit of ground. Okay. And, uh, so, yeah, so that, yeah, that's good. Let me see if. Uh, I mean, except to say that um, Calypso, what do you call it? Uh, Soka, okay. what, what do you call it? Um, new Age Soka, old school Soka, and the new Soka, reg ra reggaeton or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It still goes back to the parent Calypso. Indeed. So in that sense, Calypso would never die, in, just in the sense that, um, I don't know if I should even say this, but if you go back to like early manifestations of worship for gods in Egypt, mm -hmm. that were kind of taken over by different religions, I mean, mm -hmm. right up to Christianity, and you might have to edit this out, whether you call it Jesus or, or some ill Egyptian form, right. it's really the same thing. Mm -hmm. it, it, um, let me stop there. Though. <laughs> I'm going to mm -hmm. get into ground where um, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. they might re reject this whole interview. So <laughs> cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. But what I want to do is I want to say thank you very much, Mr. McIntosh, for agreeing to come on this platform and share your thoughts about Calypso, um, where it has gone. Um, where it is going, where it has been, um, and about your experience in particular, um, working with the artists um, of the region and um, that experience that you would have actually had in the studios and in the, in New York. So I want to thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Well, thanks again for having right. me on the show. You're thanks, very thanks, welcome. Megan. All right. All right. So bye take bye. care. All right then. Bye-bye. All right.